All right, well, if all hearts are clear, turn with me to the book of Daniel. Last week we introduced it, and tonight uh, we're going to uh, be jumping headlong into it. Book of Daniel, chapter 1. We started, like I said, we introduced last week, but we started in Matthew, and one of Jesus' uh, comments about Daniel and just how we need to trust in God's word and how this book is ridiculed because of its prophetic accuracy. And uh, it's just important for us to go through it, but um, we're going to try and do this uh, chapter each Sunday evening. And uh, we'll trust in the Lord's leading and guiding. And if he tells us to stop, we'll stop. If he tells us to go on, we'll keep going on. Book of Daniel. If you've got Daniel chapter 1, say Amen. amen. I get, I get tickled. Brother Bud Allman on Sunday morning told you the page number in his Bible. And I'm looking down at this and I don't have a page number in mine <laughs> for this page where it starts. The next page, chapter, uh, uh, it starts at 1159. I don't know why mine only has a page number on certain pages, but it does. Uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 1. We'll read just the first two verses to get started and then we'll pray. In the, third year of king, uh, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto, uh, I told you we want to stop there. We'll stop there and we'll, we'll pray. I was just excited. Mm -hmm. Our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we worship you tonight in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we ask for your name to be glorified in all things. Lord, we ask that you'd help us to go further into your word each and every day as we read it personally. And Lord, as we share from this sacred desk your word. I pray and ask that you would help us to glean from it more, Lord, that we would be instructed in ways of righteousness and that we would find your word profitable to us, making us thoroughly equipped to live the life you've called us to live. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So we know Daniel, we've already introduced that Daniel was very important to Jesus when he was prophesying on Mount Olivet and we have that record and we talked about that preached on that last week but Daniel himself if you look throughout the scriptures he is a very important individual he's probably around the age of 15 when he is um, taken out of the land of Israel he's taken out of Jerusalem uh, along with other captives and he lives in a foreign land until he's in his probably nine, uh, age of 90s. Um, so he he's, uh, lives a long life, but he lives the majority of it in, as a captive in a foreign nation. And uh, the amazing thing is that we see God's hand upon him as soon as he gets there. Um, we, we, we see that demonstrated in several people's lives that have went in captivity. One of the most famous ones that we can think of, one of the earliest ones is Joseph. If you remember in the book of Genesis, Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. And uh, almost as quickly as he got to Egypt in Potiphar's house, the one who bought him, he became the steward of that house very, very, very quickly. Um, uh, when he was released, we've seen him rise up to be basically the head um, of, of Egypt, except for Pharaoh when he was sitting on his throne. He was the steward of Egypt. So God has a way of lifting individuals up, even in their captivity. And that is something that should be encouraging to you and me, regardless of our circumstances. No matter how bleak things are around us, God can do marvelous things Amen. in our lives. But again... Uh, Daniel, he became very well known and basically he became what we would say the prime minister of two different countries. As we shared, uh, it was the Babylonians who took over the southern kingdom, the remaining two tribes of Israel, when Daniel was about 15 years old. And that's what we read here in this passage of scripture, these first two of the Babylonian king 
taking over this remaining tribe and taking away Daniel and the young men, the young women, and the furniture of the tabernacle. Uh, later on, Babylon would be taken over by the country called Persia. And Persia um, uh, would, would absorb them into their nation. And even there, uh, Daniel would become a very important advisor to the king of Persia. God's hand was all over Daniel's life. So, so what is Daniel's life? What was he like? We see snippets of some of the things we know of Daniel and the lion's den. But what was going on? What was, how did he get there? How do we see God using him? It wasn't, it wasn't an overnight thing where he assumed his authority and his influence. But God blessed him over a couple of years. But we begin to look here again. And we talk about in these first two verses uh, about the, the uh, siege that Babylon laid in Jerusalem. And how they took out. And so this is all of Israel is now taken out of their land. There might have been a, a few that was left there. But the majority of Israel had now been taken to Babylon. And they were put into captivity in a foreign land. And so, so we see, see uh, just about how God used judgment on these people. Israel had neglected the word of God. And if we neglect God's word for very long and we violate its principles as the people of God, we can be sure that divine judgment will come sooner or later. God will not be mocked. And even this world is going to be judged. God has already judged it and God has already condemned this world. And he will make all things right. His judgment will be played out to the end. And we, uh, as we preached this morning, we read it in, in Romans chapter 5. We have been given the hope that through faith in Jesus Christ, we will escape the wrath to come through his blood. And so, so we, we, we have God's sending judgment on Israel and these individuals are taken out. And so you come in in verse 2 and it talks about how uh, the king of Israel or the king of Judah was given to the king. He, he, he captured Jehoiakim, King Jehoiakim of Judah. And a part, it says, of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar. Now, this should give you a little bit of an understanding. If you've studied the Bible, um, the, we're introduced to the land of Shinar. It is a constant place and it is a place that God had been preparing for such a time as this. Even though they're out of the will of God, God used Babylon to correct the wayward path of the people of God. You say, well, when did God start this? Well, if we go back to the book of Genesis, we read of a individual who was rebellious after uh, they came out of the ark. Uh, Noah's Ark. We know that story. After they came out of the ark and Noah's sons, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth began to populate the world, one of them eventually had an uh, ancestor who was very, very rebellious. And he's got, a, he's, got, he's got a great name for what he, his character was. His name was Nimrod. That sounds like a great name to have. Baby born and look at it and say, I'm going to call you Nimrod. I don't know. Um, but Nimrod went to the plains of Shinar and he founded a group of people there. And eventually this group of people in their following Nimrod's stead uh, said, we don't really need God. And unless we be scattered throughout this world and we, we be taken over, um, we need to do something about it. So let's build a tower that reaches into the heavens and have a secure place and make a name for ourselves. And God came down to see what they were doing. And as he was looking around, he said, he said they, they, they would be able to build this great tower and they'll do whatever their heart desires. So let's confuse the languages and uh, disperse them. And so God uh, confused the languages at this tower that they built. And the people could no longer work together because they could not understand one another and they left building this and that was called the Tower of Babel. Now you know why it's called the Tower of Babel. They babble, 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 babble. They couldn't understand one another and this became this plain of Shinar that we read in verse 2 is the plain of Shinar that the Tower of Babel 
was constructed on. And so this place was always associated with being rebellious and against the people of God. Now, we would know this better as modern day Iran and Iraq. <clears throat> but it says that they took the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. This is important for later on. Nebuchadnezzar's God, the main God of the Babylonian Empire, was named Marduk. And what they had, what he did with this furniture is he took it and he had his people carry it in and they set all the temple furniture, the, tavern, uh, the temple furniture of Israel inside the temple of Marduk. You say, well, why would they do that? Didn't they have enough stuff? Yes, they had their own furniture to do their sacrifices to their God. But the idea of placing Israel's furniture in there as well was that it was kind of like an offering or it was kind of like a symbol of uh, their victory over the God of Israel. It's kind of like going into a hunter's house and you have all of their trophies along the wall. Or in a sportsman's house and he's got all of his basketball sports trophies to declare his victories over opponents. And that was what this verse 2 is saying. Nebuchadnezzar was gloating in his victory over Israel by putting the temple furniture in the house of his God. And it was a way of saying, our God beat your God, Israel. And anytime you need a remembrance, just come in here and you will see your temple furniture as offerings to our God because we beat you. Our God is stronger than your God was what he was in a way saying. Now, as we begin to read on, we are introduced to these individuals that we find so familiar in this book. Continue reading on with me in verse three from verse three to verse seven it says, and the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed, a, a king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish. But well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had an ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So he nourishing, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and of Mishael of Meshach, and of Azariah of Abednego. So when we talk about Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, we're using Daniel's Hebrew name, but we're referring to the three other Hebrew boys by their Babylonian captive names. So their full Hebrew names, if you didn't catch that, was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's their Hebrew names. Now, how did God select these young men to represent the nation of Israel and to represent himself before Babylon? He did this by purposing it on King Nebuchadnezzar's heart to select certain individuals from Israel to teach them the Babylonian ways. He might have done this for a couple of reasons. The first reason is if you notice there in verse 3, it says that he took certain of the king's seed. He took the children, the nieces and nephews. He took the family members of King Jehoiakim and that kingly line. Possibly for a way of holding them as, as, as guarantees that Israel would not push back against Babylon. It was kind of a way of having certain individuals within arm's reach of the king as, as a motivation to serve. You don't serve me, I'll kill off the king's seed. Which would have been devastating to Israel because they had the promise that the Messiah would come through the kingly lineage. 
And so, so that was very important for them to keep intact. And it was a way, a warfare, warfare tactic for them to keep Israel in line by holding the kingly seat. But he didn't just pick them. He picked other individuals such as these four Hebrew children that are named. And they begin to put them into training. So why them? Why them? Well, this was a way of getting the whole nation enculturated to the Babylonian ways. To get them to forget their Israelite heritage and to forget God. So what they did is they took all the brightest and the most well-respected young men that was in the community. People that Nebuchadnezzar and the eunuchs recognized would have influence if they were left in their own country. And so they took them and began to train them for three years in order that they could, one, help the king administer uh, any Jewish affairs that might later come on. If there was any Jewish practices or anything of that nature, Jewish history, history he could work with these individuals. But the other way is that these individuals who are now trained, who were Israelites trained in the Babylonian way, could go out and train other Israelites how to be Babylonian. Because the idea was to remove them from their country, scatter them about the nation, and make them lose their identity. You isolated them from their heritage. Then you begin to um, enculturate them into your culture so that they lose their history. Sounds like what they're trying to do right now. Sounds like they're what, exactly what they're trying to do right now. They make you forget your history. They make you forget your heritage. And then they can tell you that you uh, are whatever you want to be. Or you go in this direction. And so, so they did this. And here's the, here's the tidbit. Every nation in all of um, in world history that has went through this. Every nation that's been beaten and taken over by an invading country. Whether it's Rome or whether it's, it's Assyria, or whether it's Babylon, or later on Persia, or the Greeks, any nation that they've absorbed into themselves, that they've conquered, has never came out. They became fully whatever their country was that took them over. Northern Israel, the ten tribes to the north, was taken over by Assyria. Those are what we now call the ten lost tribes of Israel. They have completely been absorbed by Assyria and lost to history. Okay. The only nation in all of history to go through almost a century of captivity and go through the rigors of this type of enculturation that these nations did, the only group that ever came out and retained any bit of their heritage is the people of Judah. And you say, why? Because even though Nebuchadnezzar and his eunuchs were selecting some bright young men that they thought they could influence to be, lead Israel to become Babylonian, God said, no, I'm going to put it on your heart to select these guys because they're going to help preserve a remnant in Israel. God knows what he's doing. It wasn't it God who came to Elijah when he was having a pity party in the cave and said, there's no one but me preaching your word? And God said, no, I have a whole, whole other cavern full of them. I know what I'm doing. I have a remnant. My seed will not be destroyed. God preserves his way. And so they selected them and they began to train them a three-year education. In Babylonian culture, in history, we read there in science, in the science of their day, in wisdom, and even language. If you read there at the end of verse 4, it says that they would learn the tongue of the Chaldeans. This would have been Aramaic. And so they would be taught in all of these things. And they changed their name. So he said, Daniel... And, and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah in verse 7 is their Hebrew names. But they were all given different names. You say, why? Because they wanted them to forget their identity. 
They wanted them to become Babylonian. But it wasn't just giving them a new name. It's, it, this wasn't witness protection program type stuff. Where you give them a name that's not associated with anything so they're not recognized. The names that they were given were given in contrast to who they were in God. Here's the meaning of their names. We, we, Abby and I, we still don't have a name for our girl. We, we are so specific on names. They have to match. And I, I, I'm afraid that we're going to be signing the birth certificate and having to finally say, well, this has got to be the name at that point. I don't, I don't know what's going on. But when they were naming names in these ancient cultures, they gave them a name regarding the situation of history, how they felt their God was blessing them. And you see that even here. There's meaning in these names. Daniel's name. Listen to this. Daniel's name, we talked last week, means God is judge. God is in charge or in rule of his life. God's his protector, right? God's the one that has the say-so in Daniel's life. That's what that name means. But the name he was given is Belteshazzar, which means may Bel protect his life. So you see how they try to influence it? Your God is not protecting your life. God is not ruling your life. No, we're going to have our God, our gods, protect your life. Hananiah, the next one, his name means the Lord is gracious. He was given the name Shadrach, which means the command of Aku, which was the Babylonian moon god. Mishael, his name meant who is what God is. Or who is like our God. He was given the name Meshach. Notice that sounds familiar to Shadrach. Meshach means who is what a coup is. See how they just completely flipped around the meanings of these names to distort the identities of these young men? Azariah, his name means the Lord helps. He was given the name Abednego, which means servant of Nebu, who was Bel's son. And so we begin to see uh, just how all of this has flipped around their culture, their way of life, their way of thinking, and even their identity of self. But it didn't stop there in what they were trying to do. In verse 5, it says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might, be, might stand before the king. They also were given direction to eat the meat, to take in the full culture. It wasn't just the thinking. It wasn't just the identity. It wasn't just the home. They were also forced to, to observe all the other intricacies of their culture. And this is where Daniel begins to show his faith in God. Verses 8 through 10 says this. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now listen to this. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who have appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking the, than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Daniel refused to be defiled with the king's meat. Now you might be asking the question, why couldn't they eat of that particular meat? Well, it's not so much what type of food it was. It wasn't so much that they were just trying to feed them pork, which we know was against the Jewish religion. There probably could have been, as they did not have those regulations in Babylon. But first off, the food provided did not meet the requirements of the Mosaic law. That it was not prepared according to the regulations and may have included meat from these forbidden animals. There wasn't just the food types that they weren't allowed to eat from. 
But there are certain preparations that food had to go through. How many of you have went through the grocery aisles even here and have noticed the difference between kosher salts, kosher butter, kosher foods, and other foods? Kosher is the Jewish word for meat or food that has been prepared in a way that has been blessed by a rabbi. That means that it's ceremonially clean for the Jewish people to eat. That won't make them ceremonially clean. Um, unclean. And so they did not know how this food was prepared. We was we ate at Bob Evans yesterday. And Wally went to the bathroom after we had all finished our meal. And Wally came out of the bathroom and said, Whew, that is the nastiest bathroom I ever went into. Stan Toller, an old preacher, Nazarene preacher, said this. He said, whenever I go to a restaurant, or if, whether I'm going through the drive-thru, or whether I'm going to sit down, I always stop and go inside the bathroom first thing before I ever order. Because what the bathroom looks like is the bathroom that their employees are using to prepare your food with washing their hands and doing all that. Now think about that. The bathroom that's got all the nastiness in it is the same bathroom your, your person preparing your food is using and touching. I didn't mean to gross you out there. But as my, I remember Ezra was doing speech up in Dublin. And uh, I, after an appointment, I took him to McDonald's. There was a really, really nice McDonald's there. And we would go in. I loved to go and sit down and eat. And it, I mean, they really had that fixed up. And so we went in and we was sitting there eating. And we're about finished with our meal. And all of a sudden, you, I, there's a worker that runs in there into the back restroom. And you just hear them um, displacing all of their guts. I mean, and you're thinking, that person just probably made my food. Whatever they've got, I'm going to get. Have you ever been to that where you've walked into a restaurant or you've seen somebody preparing your food and you're thinking, I'm going to go to the restaurant next door? Because you are worried about what you're eating, about what you're putting in. The Jewish people, it wasn't simply what type of food, it was how was the food prepared? Was it prepared in a way that honored God or was it prepared in a way that is unclean? And so that was something that would have compromise their faith. Secondly, there was no complete prohibition in the matter of drinking wine in the law, but there was a problem with that wine as well as the meat. And here's the bottom line with that. Had they, is whether that meat had been dedicated to idols as was customary in Babylon. What they would do is they would go and sell or, or bring their meat and lay it before a uh, altar for one of their false gods and sacrifice it to them. And then they would, the priest would take that meat and sell it out on the streets for income to the temples. And what that, what, they would, what that was doing is this was meat previously sacrificed to idols. And so Daniel and his friends, they could not eat. There were strict prohibitions that they could not eat food that had been sacrificed or offered to false gods. To do so would be to recognize the idols as deities. Would be to recognize. That's why Paul later on in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, had to settle a debate of whether the Jews could go to the Gentiles' house because they were afraid the meat being fed to them had been previously offered to idols. Now I'll let you go home and read that to see what Paul's conclusion after grace had came in had happened but that was the problem here they did not want the king's meat because they had no idea how it was prepared they had no idea where it came from but to do so would be to uh, compromise their faith and so here's the thing they're in a new home they're isolated they're, in a, uh, they're given a new knowledge. And so they are being indoctrinated. And now they have, they have been given this new food, which was a direct compromise of their faith. And as Michael, what, what you said, 
We're being isolated. I, we're being isolated. I mean, I, I enjoy Amazon just as much as the next person. But here, 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 think of this. I don't have to get out of my house to do any of my shopping, meaning I don't have to deal with anybody. And if I have to go make that quick run to the grocery store or to the Walmart or whatever, I still don't have to deal with anybody if I don't want to, unless something goes wrong. I can go in, get my stuff, and go to a self-checkout register. And unless something goes wrong that I need assistance, I can do that entire trip without engaging with one person. We live in a world that is becoming increasingly connected through the internet and through technology, but at the same time, we're becoming increasingly isolated from one another. Just go into a restaurant, into a family meeting, a family reunion or anything, and you will see a dozen people on their cell phones sitting across from each other, texting each other instead of looking up from it. We are in an isolated culture. And then we have indoctrination. We send our kids to schools that are teaching them things that are against the Bible. We have uh, movies and we have TV shows and radio things that are constantly coming into our minds that are teaching us things that are contrary to the scriptures. And when we try to take a stand for God, when we try to take a stand for our values... We are encouraged to compromise them and look the other way. We're living in Babylon. We're living not in this world is not our home. And Daniel and his comrades, they went through that. And he says, I can't. He didn't say no to the name. He, he, he knew there was a place to draw the line. He said he didn't say no to the name. In fact, he will refer to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter uh, uh, 4. He will refer to them in that portion of Scripture by those names. But he just, he just, he, he, didn't, he didn't push against the education. He, did, he, 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 was, he didn't push against that. But what he could not do in the end was compromise his faith. And this is my hope. When we send our kids to, to, to those indoctrination centers of public schools and universities that are not grounded on the word of God. Yes, I don't like it, but I don't have to fear because I know if Daniel can go through three years of foreign indoctrination to his faith. And come through still faithful. They can go to public schools and they can do those things and survive. Daniel, he heard it and he kept himself grounded in the word. It's okay for us to study and be familiar with the beliefs of other systems. I don't believe that you can understand your own faith unless you do. And you can't defend your faith if you don't know what you're defending it against. But the thing that Daniel could not do was to begin to live according to the world. He understood the world that he was living in. He was able to do his business in the world that he was living in because he took on that name. But he would not live like the world. You and I, we may be in this world, but we're not to be a part of this world. You and I, we can understand how this world operates. We can understand what people are thinking. We can associate with them by conversation because we know what they're thinking and what their viewpoint is. We can begin to do our business in this world, but this world is not our home. We're not to live like this world. And so Daniel had a proposal to be faithful to the Lord. Notice what this was. He didn't rebel. He didn't make a protest. That's, that's one of the craziest things I, that, that, I, that I just can't do. I do not like rebellious attitudes. I don't like protesting. I'm, I, I don't know if it's just my quiet nature, my backward nature, or, or whatever. I don't like conflict. But I don't, I don't like protesting. And so he didn't protest. He didn't go out and hold a sign. He didn't, he didn't go beat on doors. He didn't throw up any fuss. He simply asked, 
can I be excused from eating the king's meat? This is where I was hoping my teens was here tonight. They didn't rebel. They didn't protest. Rather, they asked to be excused. You have the freedom to withdraw and excuse yourself from those things that will compromise your faith. You have the freedom to say no to what the world invites you to. I was really thinking of my teenagers, especially every little dance that the school has, they can feel free to excuse themselves from it. You can excuse yourself from compromising situations. You don't have to go. Later on, we will see countries, the Greek countries that come in and rule over Israel before Rome came in. They will try to force Israel to do certain things. But at this point in time in Babylon, they and Persia, they will have the freedom to excuse themselves. And you and I have the freedom. You and I are not forced to watch the nudity that's on TV. You and I are not forced to listen to the propaganda of the world on the radio station. You and I have the freedom to turn that stuff off and not fill our minds with it. We can excuse ourselves from situations. When we're asked by somebody to come to a party from our work or from a family event, and you know that there's going to be uh, illicit things, you know there's going to be things unpleasing to God, and you will be pressured to do them yourself, you can excuse yourself from those situations. Yeah. And God gave them favor. God gave them favor. In verse 9 it says... God had brought favor. He, he, the, the, the eunuchs, the people that were leading Daniel and his friends through this time of preparation, the teachers, their handlers, they liked him. And God gave him favor to have that opportunity to excuse. You notice what the eunuch said. He says, says, why would you do this? He didn't flat out say no. He says, why would you do this? Because... If you don't eat this food, you're going to get sick. Why would you, after three years of uh, 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 not eating very little, if anything at all, want to stand before the king in a starved body? He talks about him being, being face, uh, have, see your face is worse. And then he says, if I don't give you this food and I don't do my job, I can have my head taken off. And so Daniel says this in verses 11 through 16. Then said Daniel to Malzar, whom the princes of the eunuchs had set over to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee in the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all of the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. So God bless these young men. Daniel said, excuse us from the king's meat. Don't let us compromise. and we'll, Let us try our thing. Ten days. We'll give you ten days. And let's see how it is after ten days. All, you want, all, all we want is pulse. Now how many raise your hand and say, I know what pulse is. I, I, I'll eat a good help in a pulse. <coughs> pulse is just the way of talking about vegetables. It was a vegetable stew. It was kind of like a vegetable plate. Of, I, I, it was a vegetarian type diet. So they were vegan. Sure. <laughs> they weren't doing it because they didn't want the animals killed or hard to come to the animals. They wouldn't eat the meat sacrificed to idols. And so they said, you're not sacrificing your corn or your wheat or your beans. So just throw that in a heaping together and we'll call that whole heap together pulse. And we'll eat nothing but vegetables for 10 days. And they did. 
And after 10 days, the Hebrew children, these four Hebrew boys, they were fatter and they were better looking in their countenance than all the other trainees. All the other people who, who were taken of the king's meat, these four were better after 10 days. God gave them favor because of their faithfulness. God blesses those who go through with him. He didn't take them out of the situation. I'm not saying that you earn credit with God by serving him. But God will bless you with his strength and his power when you take a stand for him. They were still in captivity. They were still going through a hard life. But God kept them because they were faithful to him. And so they ended up doing this for three years. I don't know about you, but that would be hard to eat just vegetables for three years. That would be a pretty basic diet. I like my meat, but these boys, they did it because they wanted to be faithful to God. And after the three years, we will see that God grew them. God blessed their faithfulness because of that. They did it for three years. Read with me now verses 17 to 19. I'm sorry, 17 to 20. Let's just read to 21. We'll read to the end chapter. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king has said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Meshiel, and Azariah. <clears throat> Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. First thing I want to point out to you in this reading. Look at the beginning of verse 17. As for these four children. God bless them. As for these four. Go back to the verse 3. And the king spake to Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. As far as we know, these four were only children of Israel. They weren't princes. They weren't the king's seed. So there was a whole lot more taken into this three-year training program than these four. But only these four do we have a record of staying faithful to God. That's a sad reality in this chapter. We read about God's faithfulness and God's blessing of these four. But where are all the others? Where are all the others that had that should have been faithful? This talks and speaks to you and me about the corrupting influence of our society. Of the Babylonian society and of our society. You need to do more than just pray that your children and your grandchildren make it through this world. And when they turn 18, stay in church. You need to raise them in church. You need to not only pray, you pray and you got to pray for them. But you need to teach them diligently the word of God. You have got to give them straight answers, not little fluffy answers. If you don't know the answer, you find somebody that can give them a solid answer for their questions about life. And why we do things as a Christian and why we do certain things that the world does not do. You need to give them solid biblical answers. Or when they turn 18, they will look at it and say everything that mommy and daddy or grandma and grandpa or uncle and aunt, all that they did and all that they tried to teach me was nothing but silliness. We have to ground them in God's word because the corrupting influence of this world is strong. And it will have their grasp in them greater and deeper than what you can ever imagine. 
But these four were faithful. From 15, now they're probably about 19, maybe 20 years old when they're standing before the king. And they were faithful. It's possible for teens to be faithful. It's possible for young men and women to be faithful to God and in a place that God can use them. And they were ten times better in knowledge, in wisdom, in science, than all the astrologers and the magicians. That's the experienced people. That's the Babylonians that were already set up in their own country. They were already, these young men, four men, were better. Notice in verse 10, or I'm sorry, verse 17. It says, all four of them, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. All four of them were grounded in their faith. So what that tells me is if you are faithful to God and you truly seek him, he can give you knowledge, yeah. skill in all learning and wisdom. He, if you apply yourself to God, God will apply himself to you. Yeah. And he will help you. That's right. But there is a difference here that it, we're pointed out to. And this is where we see it in the scriptures with Daniel. We'll have one story about the other three Hebrew boys. About their faithfulness again to God. But it says in Daniel in verse 17. Had understanding in all visions and dreams. He became one that could receive visions from God and could interpret them. And that's where we go with from the book of Daniel. When we come into the next chapter, Nebuchadnezzar will have a dream that no one can interpret. And they'll come to Daniel. Daniel all, all four of them were good, strong men in the faith. But God had selected Daniel. And that's something to you and me. God has a different purpose for each of us. Not all of us are preachers. Not all of us are teachers or singers. But God has a place for each of us in our calling. Now when we end this chapter, what we see is God's faithfulness. God preparing a remnant that his name will not be extinguished in Israel and in the world. And God is doing it through a few young individuals who would not compromise their faith. And so let me ask you tonight, where have you compromised in your walk with the Lord? Where have you compromised and cut corners knowing that God had called you to do otherwise? But for brevity of time or because you needed to feel like you lightened your load a little bit or you satisfied your flesh for a moment. Where have you compromised your testimony of believing and following the Lord? These young men had everything working against them, but they would not compromise. God will not bless them. God will not bless our compromise. And so tonight, you and I have a call to be faithful. As we stand, those singing.